Good morning. If you're watching this live streamed, or hello, if you're tuning in later on, I'm glad that you've joined us for this service. It's a new year. I was driving through town yesterday, and I uh, passed by another another church, and I and I read the sign they had out in front of the church, and you know what it said? Happy New Fear. And I and I and I, I did a double take. I said, "Happy New Fear." Now that's something I, I hadn't I hadn't heard that one before. And I and I looked again, and and the font was a little fancy, and uh, the Y looked like an F. And I think I was projecting onto that sign, "Happy New Fear." Uh, it's been a fearful year, in the past year certainly has, and we've been told that the coming winter, at least, is going to be a hard winter of loss. So the thought of this can, can bring up feelings of, of fear. It's understandable. Even as we are saying goodbye to a fearful year, we're saying hello to another one, and, and we're not sure what it holds. It's okay if you feel maybe a little bit fearful. This is a place where we learn that when we do gather as a community, we discover compassionate connections that lift us above our fears we give that gift to one another. And during this time when we cannot gather and experience this in person and, and see the visible tree of our congregation, be aware of our roots that lie underground and cannot be seen and yet sustain us all during this winter of separation. Welcome. Our opening hymn today is Come, Come, Whoever You Are. It's number 188 in the gray hymnal, and we're going to sing it through twice. Christmas evening while all the doors were shuttered tight outside standing lonely boy child cold and shivering in the night Noel Noel on the street every Oh, save but one was gleaming bright And to this window walked the boy child Peeking in saw candlelight Noel, Noel Through other windows he had looked At turkeys, ducks, geese and cherry pies but through this window saw gray-haired lady, table bare and tears in her eyes. Noel, Noel. Into his coat reached the boy child, knowing well there was little there. He took from his pocket his own Christmas dinner bit of cheese, some bread to share, Noel, Noel. His outstretched hands held the food and they trembled, 
As the door it opened wide, said he, Would you share with me Christmas dinner? Gently said she, Come inside, Noel, Noel. The gray-haired lady brought forth to the table glasses too and her last drop of wine, said she, Here's a toast to everyone's Christmas, and especially yours and mine. Noel, Noel. And it came to pass on a Christmas evening, while all the doors were shuttered tight, that in that town the happiest Christmas was shared by candlelight. Noel, Noel, Noel. Good morning. I'm Brenna Norville, and I'm your celebrant this morning. Here in this place of peace, may we find hope. Here in this place of connection, may we find life-giving community. Here in this place of rest, let the unrest of our hearts turn us toward justice. Here in this space made sacred by memories of connection, let us feel ourselves a part of the new that grows from the old in the spiraling unity of years. Let us join in connection and say together our affirmation. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration. Build a community of caring fellowship. Nurture the hopes and serve the needs of our world. We pause this morning from the chaos of the world to reclaim the beauty within these walls that carry us through our week. We lift this community onto our shoulders with pride and grace-filled expectations for our children and our children's children. Each week, we light three chalices. The first is for this congregation the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Salem. The second is for our partner church in Sheman Falva, Transylvania, Romania. And we light our third chalice for our children and youth in lifespan religious education and in our world at large. Let us sing the flame into life. Hello and welcome to the Time for All Ages portion of the service. Today I'm going to do something a little different. Today I'm going to tell you a story and then I'm also going to read a brief excerpt published by the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition in 2019 as a commentary on the story for your parents and the other adults in the room. This story is called Indra's Magnificent Jeweled Net. It is a traditional Buddhist and Hindu story, and this version is available on the UUA website as part of the Building Bridges curriculum. Far, far away in the abode of the great god Indra, king of heaven, hangs a wondrous, vast net, much like a spider's web in intricacy and loveliness. It stretches out indefinitely in all directions, at each node or crossing point of the net hangs a single glittering jewel. Since the net itself is infinite in dimension, the jewels are infinite in number. The sparkling jewels hang there suspended and supported by the net, glittering 
like stars, dazzling to behold. Close your eyes now and imagine what this magnificent jeweled net looks like, spread across the vast expanse of space. Now, keep your eyes closed and move in close to one jewel in the net. Look closely and you will see that the polished surface of the gem reflects all of the other jewels in the net, infinite in number, just as two mirrors placed opposite each other reflect an image ad infinitum. Each jewel reflected in this gem you are gazing into also reflects the other jewels, so the process of reflection is infinite. Now open your eyes and know that you are a sparkling jewel in Indra's net, as is every person around you. Every jewel is connected with all of the other jewels in the net. Every person is intimately connected with all other persons in the universe. Each has an independent place within the net, and we all reflect and influence each other. A change in one jewel or one person produces a change, however slight, in every other. Realize, too, that the infinite reflections speak to the illusory nature of appearances. Appearances are not, in fact, reality, but only a reflection. The true nature of a thing is not to be captured in its appearance. However powerful that appearance might be, it is yet only a reflection of what is real. In addition, whatever you do to one jewel affects the entire net, as well as yourself. You cannot damage one strand of a spider web without injuring the entire web. And you cannot damage one strand of the web that is the universe without injuring all others in it, whether that injury is known or unknown to them. This can work for good or for ill, because, of course, just as destructive acts affect the entire net, so do loving, constructive, compassionate acts affect the entire net. A single helpful act, even a simple act of kindness, will send positive ripples across the infinite net, touching every jewel and every person in existence. And now, an excerpt of commentary from Whose Dharma Is It Anyway? Identity and Belonging in American Buddhist Post-Modernities by Joyce Janka Aji and published by the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition. At its core, Buddhism is a radical deconstruction of identity beyond all persona, social locations, and limits of conceptual thought. This is not meant to serve as a theoretical or philosophical exercise, but rather as a very pragmatic strategy aimed at the elimination of suffering by addressing its root cause, believing in, grasping at, and trying to secure a selfhood that does not fundamentally exist. As Pema Chodron, American Buddhist nun, describes her spiritual practice, I've been studying and practicing the Buddha's teaching and thus had spent years trying to deconstruct my identity, to see it as something merely labeled, not something fixed, not something I truly was. So many of our problems, personal, national, and international, come from clinging to these erroneous, solid identities. Thus, in Buddhism, we are not trying to find out who we are, but who we are not. We work to free ourselves from all of our erroneous and concrete conceptions about who we are. The teaching of no self or anatman does not imply a nihilistic lack or void as early Western interpretations of Buddhism suggested. Neither does it support a strictly materialist view as implied by our secularized and scientific culture. Rather, it points to an understanding that the emptiness of intrinsic selfhood is another way of understanding the fact that all of existence is not only interconnected, but completely intercausal and interdependent. The classical illustration of this is the image of Indra's net in the Flower Ornament Sutra. The sutra describes infinite and celestial net which extends across all of space and time and dimensions. At every intersection of the net lies a multifaceted jewel 
which reflects and simultaneously is reflected by, ad infinitum, all other jewels and the entirety of the net itself. Therefore, in my own words and in my own personal understanding, as I was taught by my teacher, Lama Sultra Malone, each jewel set upon Indra's net in its true essence is a seed of pure, unstained Buddha nature. And every label we affix either upon our own jewel or that of another is but an illusory and transient ornament of identity. Thank you for listening. Blessed be, and may all beings be happy. Please do consider joining us for the Children's Religious Exploration Program being held live on Sunday mornings at 9.45 a.m. via Zoom, or for the youth group meeting time at 5 p.m. on Thursday via Zoom. Jesús tiene sueño, bendito sea, bendito sea. A la nanita, na, na, nanita, ella, nanita, ella. Mi Jesús tiene sueño, bendito sea, bendito sea. Fuentesía que corre, clara y sonora. Señor quien la sabe cantando lloras callad mientras la cuna se balancea a la nanita nana nanita ella a la nanita nana Jesús tiene sueño, bendito sea, bendito sea. A la nanita, na, na, nanita, ella, nanita, ella. Mi Jesús tiene sueño, bendito sea, bendito sea. Florecía del capo rosa en capulla. Mi vida finia mientras te orgullo, callad mientras lo cuna se balancea a la nanita nana, nanita ella, a la nanita nana. Thank you, Marcia, for that beautiful music. Beautiful. It's so nice to hear your voice again. I'd like to invite you to take a deep breath and just pause and be in this moment. Think of your life from a loftier perspective. I do so at the end of the day. Could be another time. You pause in pursuit of that which lies just beyond your reach. 
and you accept what is in this moment. It's a good time to look back at your day. When I was a young boy, I was taught to pray before bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. May God bless everyone. Such was my childhood prayer. A scary theology for a boy, this idea that I might die, this idea that the Lord might not take my soul. Today, my theology is different. Yet the pause at the end of the day to consider the mysterious heights and depths of life and to be reminded of our call to bless others was not altogether to the bad. It's good to look back on your day at the end of every day and be aware of any missed opportunities because you hopefully will awake for another day and get another chance to bless the world with your compassion. And I invite you now to envision all those in the world all those in the world whom your heart yearns to bless with your compassion. Compassion is our way. And gratitude. It's a new year. So says our calendar. In truth, each moment is new. A new opportunity to think and feel more deeply. A new opportunity to be aware of the very gift of life. And this amazing world, this amazing universe. Each moment is a new opportunity to be aware of the loved ones, the friends, the companions in your life for an altogether too brief spell of time. Each moment is a new opportunity to be aware of how you benefit from the hard labor of others, the commitment of others, the love of others. Each moment is therefore a new opportunity for gratitude. And I invite you now to envision your life in all its height and depth and be aware of all the gifts that flow to you in your place on Indra's net. Let us be grateful. Let us be compassionate. For this is our way. Amen.
You are invited January 10th to Compassionate Connections. It happens the second Sunday of the month via Zoom at noon. If you have joys and concerns that you wish to have read during our service, please go to our webpage, find the joys and concerns, and click the button so that you can submit. Our pastoral hymn today is Voice Still and Small. It's number 391 in the Gray Hymnal. the refuge of this Sabbath home, we turn our busy minds toward silence and our full hearts toward one another. We move together through the mysteries, the bright surprise of birth and the shadowed questions of death. In our slow walk between the two, we will be wounded and we will be showered with grace amazing, unending. Even in our sorrows, we feel our lives cradled in holiness we cannot comprehend. And though we each walk within a vast loneliness, the promise we offer here is that we do not walk alone. This is a holy place in which we gather the light of the earth brought in and held, touched then by our answering light, the flame on a chalice, the flicker of a candle, the lamps of our open faces brought near, in this place of silence and celebration, solemnity and music, we make a sanctuary and name our home. Thank you, Brenna. Those are such wonderful words you've choose for our services, so I really appreciate the good work you put into that. So, it is January the 4th, I believe, 20, or 3rd, see, that's why I have people here to, to help me out. It's January the 3rd, 2021. 2020 is over. I wonder what this next year is going to be like. So, I thought I would check in to see what they say Nostradamus's predictions are for 2021. You may not realize that there was actually a figure named Nostradamus. You only see him generally on uh, images in the checkout line at the tabloids at the grocery store, but he actually was a, a French seer, lived back in the 1500s, the 16th century. You can read about him. His, his predictions for the future were anxiously awaited every year. So here's what one source says, so I don't want to blame Nostradamus on these predictions, but here's what one source says that Nostradamus says that 2021 is going to be like. Are you ready? Well, here it comes. <clears throat> a Russian scientist is going to create a biological weapon that's going to wipe us all out, except for a few zombie survivors. 
Not, all right, it's not good. It's also going to be a famine. Artificial intelligence is going to take over and rule the world. And there's going to be a World War II and an economic collapse. Solar explosions are going to destroy the electric grid and wreak havoc. A comet is either going to hit us or come darn near close. And an earthquake is going to destroy California. I'm not sure how you can squeeze that much calamity into one year, but it sure sounds like it's going to be a rough year, and we thought 2020 was rough. Whew. Well, perhaps unbeknownst to you, as I drug you through those horrendous scenarios, I have led us through a psychological spiritual exercise of practice favored by the ancient Stoic. It's called uh, premeditatio malorum. Premeditatio malorum. What do you think that means? Premeditation of evils. My goodness, why would you want to premeditate evils? Well, simply put, the Stoics recognize that if you imagine and expect the worst and prepare your mind for that, and then when something does actually happen, it's almost always not as bad as we imagine it won't shake you up as much because you've thought about it, you've prepared yourself, and you know there's something to that. I often will be counseling with people and I'll say, well, what's the worst case scenario? Let's just get it out on the table. Let's talk about the worst case scenario. And that's sort of a, another version of that. Of course, you can, you can overdo this pre-meditatio malorum business and become you get frozen into this worst case scenario outlook and end up as a, as a prophet of doom and gloom. I don't want to do that. In fact, no one can accurately predict the future because there are an infinite number of moving parts at play and, and none of us happens to be omniscient. So whenever you hear these prognostications and predictions of the future, always remember no one really knows. And so I wonder if rather than having New Year's predictions, we might have New Year's proposals, as in proposing visions for the future, visions that line up with our values. You could call them resolutions. We all talk about New Year's resolutions, but I think of resolutions as something that's done on an individual level. So I'm going to call these proposals. I have two proposals for this new year. We're learning some painful but invaluable lessons during this pandemic, and it's, it's important that they not be forgotten because they provide key insights into the things that I think we're called to envision. One key lesson is one, it's been learned many times before, but we need to keep learning it. Consider this, in the earliest days of Christianity, some who were the most devout they felt this call, this yearning to pull away from the cities, to go out into the desert and seek God and lead a pure spiritual life in solitude. Yet, as solitary seeker after seeker lost their mental health in such isolation, they realized eventually that everyone needs the support of community. That's why the earliest monastic communities were formed. People recognized this need. We are social beings. We need to have regular and meaningful interaction with others for our well-being. Even before the pandemic, increasing social isolation, loneliness, and depression and were disturbing features of life in our country today. So many people, social isolation, loneliness, depression, the pandemic has greatly exacerbated this and has led to a mental health crisis. This calls to mind that old Beatles song, you remember it? I bet I'd love to hear you sing it sometime, Marcia. It's that song, Eleanor Brigby, which has that haunting chorus. All the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? Well, we belong together. We belong together. Circumstances that kept us apart for so long that we, you and I, I think have a deeper appreciation of our need 
to live in community with others. There are so many factors pushing us apart today, and yet healthcare professionals are now realizing that social connections are not something you can do or not do. They are vital to a person's well-being. This is nothing new. We knew this before the pandemic, but now that we've been isolated, we really, really have a stronger sense of our need for social connections and community. In truth, talking about epidemics, talking about epidemics, this one is, there's another epidemic going on. There is an epidemic of loneliness in our society. The statistics on the rise of loneliness and isolation, they're staggering, and the ill effects on our mental and physical health are undeniable. A recent study by economists reveals that residents in the nursing homes right now are dying, not all of them from the COVID-19, some of the people in these homes are dying of loneliness, of loneliness. So sad to think about that. So one proposal for the new year is to make connection, to find community or help create one, advocate for social policies and programs that recognize everyone's need for social connections. Does this sound namby-pamby to you? It, it doesn't have to be. Consider what happened when it became indisputably clear that smoking tobacco causes cancer and is therefore a health risk. When we finally got it, the tobacco companies weren't too happy about this, but eventually the science was irrefutable and we got it. An incredible progress has been made in breaking Americans of a deadly habit. So I think we can embrace habits and practices that will help Americans with a broken heart. Enabling and empowering people, high and low and everyone, to be able to find others with whom to share this precious life. It should be a priority proposal, examining those things that separate us so we can envision how to end the widespread isolation and loneliness rampant in our society. It's dreadful. Why should so many people, why should so many people suffer so needlessly? Needless suffering calls to mind a parable by Jesus. Jesus, it's called the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. You find it in the Gospel of Luke. It begins, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. What a dreadful image. The listener is immediately outraged to learn of the rich man's callous, dehumanizing indifference to Lazarus living right outside his gate. Then our outrage finds immediate satisfaction because Lazarus dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom, heaven I guess. The rich man dies and he goes to Hades where he begs as Lazarus once begged for a drop of water, just a drop of water to assuage his raging thirst. But it's too late. And Abraham responds to the pleas of the rich man across this vast chasm. And he says, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can any cross over from there to us. It was too late, it was too late. Indeed, there are times when it is too late. You might think it's strange that I'm reading a parable about uh, the rich man going to hell since we're Unitarian Universalists and we don't necessarily believe in hell, but it, there's, there's more to this parable. 
the Protestant reformer Martin Luther noted that in this parable, the hell that the rich man ends up in, it's not the eternal hell in the afterworld. It is the hell of conscience. That is where the rich man is. It's the hell of conscience. Have you ever seen film footage of German civilians after World War II? They were forced by the Allies to walk through the concentration camps and look at the corpses of the emaciated Jews after the war. And you see that stricken hell of conscience look on their faces, on some of their faces. And they know that their denial and their indifference played a role in allowing the Holocaust to happen, and they knew it, and it was too late. It was too late. Sometimes it's too late. The pandemic has laid bare the inequities and inequalities in our society. The lines of those hoping to catch some crumbs that fall from society's common table grows bigger by the day. Those without adequate medical care, or shelter, or employment is also growing by the day, and we are failing the vulnerable. We are failing the vulnerable. The great sorrow here is that there is enough for everyone, and yet we have lacked the imagination and the resolve to share Earth's bounty, and this costs lives. This costs lives. It has especially caused lives during this pandemic. It has especially laid bare the racial inequities in our society. So Jesus' parable is, I think, is, apt, is as apt today as it was in his time. And it's actually, I find, the more I think about it, I find it to be a haunting parable because... I realize in the world scene, relatively speaking, I'm one of the rich ones. I'm one of the rich ones. Today, it's not just the haves who do not acknowledge the humanity of the have-nots. We, too many of us, don't acknowledge the humanity of one another. At least many do not. Get this, this is a disturbing poll, I think, a disturbing poll that found that 40% of us, 40% of our country, 40% of the people in our country, nearly half of us see those who hold opposing views as evil, evil. Now that evil, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting word or maybe a disturbing word, a very worrisome word. When you consider, when you categorize somebody as evil, you have, in effect, condemned them to eternal damnation. That is, you will always damn them because there's nothing that they can say or do that can undo the fact that they, in your estimation, are inherently evil. Have you ever met an evil person? Have you, have you ever met an evil person? I, I've met a few men on death row who many consider to be evil. And I discovered that they were human beings who had done evil things, not evil human beings. One man I met there I could make connections with some of the others I met on death row, but not this guy. I, I think he was a very dangerous and deceptive psychopath, unwilling to acknowledge what he had done. Yet even people such as him, I think, are deserving of compassion, even as we must protect ourselves from them. You know, when you categorize somebody as evil, as 40% of us are doing to one another right now, this leads us down a very, very dangerous path. And that's why I appreciate the Eastern religions sometimes. Eastern religions, Hindu, Buddhism, uh, they provide a helpful alternative concept to evil. And it is 
avidya, avidya, which means ignorance. And it's a certain kind of ignorance. It's a fundamental blindness about reality. This isn't the kind of ignorance that is the result of a lack of information. It's the kind of ignorance that is about your inability or one's inability to experience your deep connection to others, to the source of being, and to your true self. Such ignorance of one's connectedness often leads to actions that could be called evil, avidya. In our country, there are so many who would not let a scrap of kindness or compassion fall from the table into the lives of those they despise. They want them gone, or at least outvoted and marginalized, left outside to beg for scraps of kindness and compassion. All of which is to say that the pandemic has exposed to us in ever more stark detail the perils of polarization. It would not be an exaggeration to say that things have really gone off the rails. The center, the center is, is not holding, it's not holding. That center where we recognize our common humanity and we recognize a common reality. Some words from William Butler Yeats' poem, The Second Coming, come to mind. Things fall apart. The center does not hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. William Butler Yeats, he wrote that poem, The Second Coming, uh, a little more than a century ago in 1918. It might be helpful for you to understand the context in which it was written. World War I had just ended, a lot of carnage there. A pandemic was raging that would, take, that would claim 50 million lives. The Irish uprising, the bloody Irish uprising was just beginning. That's, that's why Yeats wrote this poem. He could write it again today. Our center is not holding, not so well at least. Conspiracy theories and demonization of others and social media echo chambers and all sorts of political polarization. It's pulling us apart into warring tribes where you see members of the other tribes is not, not even, you can't convince them, they're just evil. You just gotta get rid of them somehow. It's a dangerous game, a very dangerous game. And I'm not sure how it's gonna play out, at least in the short run. It could go badly for a time as the forces of division and discord gain the upper hand. I'm worried about our democracy in this coming week. I think we'll survive, but there are some forces pulling us apart. We've been there before. We have, our nation. We have a tragic flaw in our national character. It seems that we must renew our ancient divisions and revisit them. And there's, there's something we gotta figure out. How to come together, how to live together. And our religious tradition provides some basic principles which if heeded, I think would serve us all. One principle which derives from our universalist background reminds us that doctrines of eternal damnation in whatever form they appear, whether it's applied to the living, when you say somebody is evil, that's it, you've condemned them. There's no help for them. That's eternal condemnation. We don't believe in that and we don't believe in an eternal hell in the afterlife. We always believe that love will win out. If you admit of just one exception, you say this one person is evil enough, should go to hell, well then pretty soon you're gonna to have to keep adding to the list. At some point, at some point, a spiritually mature person realizes that the evil that they condemn in others, a spiritually mature person realizes, I think at some point, that the evil 
that they condemn in others also lurks within their own hearts. And such recognition brings with it a level of humility, a reluctance to judge others and to have more curiosity about them. A reluctance to judge others and having more curiosity about them. So here's a final proposal. I'd say this is a good time. This is a good year to end the practices of hating and despising and demeaning and disparaging one another and begin the practices of genuine curiosity and humility. Perhaps it can help us find our way to the common center where all are included. You think we can do it? Do you? I mean, I, I believe we must. And I believe we can because I trust in the goodness of the human heart. Is it foolish for me to think so? Many would say so. But I'm with the intrepid explorer Ernest Shackleton who said that optimism is a form of moral courage. Would you join me now as we reflect on the state of our world, on the state of our souls, Recognize your power to affect change, however small. Recognize your responsibility to play the role, to fulfill yourself in service to the greater whole. Reflect on your life so that you make choices and are not simply swept along by dangerous emotions that destroy. There's a better way. There's a better way and we will find it. Amen. We support UUCS through our pledges, time, and connections with one another. We support the Salem community through donations to the Marion and Polk Food Share, and for the month of January, the family promise. Their mission is to help homeless and low-income families achieve sustainable independence through a community-based response. They initiate coordinated local efforts that bring communities together to help homeless families regain their housing, their independence, and their dignity. The issue can seem overwhelming and individuals may feel powerless to change the lives of people in poverty. As Family Promise volunteers, more than 200,000 people have found a way. Working together, they provide temporary housing, meals, and services to more than 125,000 family members annually. They mentor at-risk families, they teach financial literacy, they help find jobs and affordable housing. They create programs to meet specific needs in their communities, and they advocate for the public policies that alleviate poverty and promote the economic stability of low-income families. Please send your checks to UUCS or visit the website to donate. Thank you for maintaining the community of UUCS and for helping the wider community of Salem. Here we 
bring you water from the well so clear for to worship God with this happy new year. Sing love it you, sing love it to the water and the wine, the seven bright gold wires and the bugles that do shine. Sing rain a fair maid with gold upon her toe open you the west door and turn the old year go sing love it to sing love it to the water and the wine the seven bright gold wars and the bugles that Sing rain a fair maid with gold upon her chin. Open you the east door and let the new year in. Sing lovey to, sing lovey to the water and the wine, the seven bright gold wine. We take the light from our chalice, lighting the social justice lantern as a symbolic reminder of the light and justice we carry out into the world. As we extinguish the chalices, let us hear these words from the Navajo Indians of North America. Beauty is before me and beauty is behind me. Above me and below me hovers the beautiful. I am surrounded by it. I am immersed in it. In my youth, I am aware of it. And in old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty, it is begun. In beauty, it is ended. Do you see that slide up there? It says Zoom Fellowship Gatherings, and I sure hope you will take advantage of that if you're able to do that. Uh, you should be able to, they, they've made it pretty easy. So you can, uh, even if we can't be together in the fellowship hall, we can be together on Zoom after the service today. So I, I hope you will join in for that. Uh, you can see how to register for that by going to the uh, uusalem.org calendar. So uh, I hope you'll take advantage of that. I have a few other announcements I want to quickly make, uh, and I'll just uh, follow the slides up there. The Habitat and Hope Village, they're having an information session uh, on Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, they're going to be discussing their proposed resolution for a congregational meeting in, in uh, February the 7th, so please see the website for details. It's an important thing for us to think about. Uh, also, see that you can join the UUCS uh, listserv electronic bulletin board so you'll have an opportunity to communicate more with people in the congregation. So next Saturday at three o'clock, what are you gonna be doing? I think I'm gonna click on my computer, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna look for, I believe there's a cello recital uh, at three o'clock from uh, by our own Kit. He's, he's been composing some music and I'm looking forward to hearing what you've done, Kit. There's about an hour of music. How, what's, what's the charge for this? Zero, we get in for free, okay. Thank you for the gift of your music. Thank you for offering that, and we look forward to that. Please remember, put it on your calendar, it's on the website, uh, three o'clock next Saturday, January the 9th. Also, you'll be receiving a, uh, a card in the mail this week, many of you, 
and it will show you how to sign up to make a prayer flag. Uh, you can see some beautiful prayer flags that, are, that have already been made. I have a table sitting behind me with several more beautiful ones. We're gonna be hanging those up as well. So please do come in and, or, or have a prayer flag mailed to you so that you can create one to, to symbolize our hopes and dreams for the coming year. I, I really look forward to seeing uh, so many beautiful prayer flags. They're starting to come in now. So please do check that out. You notice that um, we, we uh, have our offering this week and, and for the month going to Family Promise. Also, please pay attention in our website uh, with the announcements, they have a, a need for volunteers, volunteers, Family Promise. We've been working with them for many, many years since we've been in this building. So please find out how you can help them. They need help on January the 17th, 21st, and 23rd, working with families in need. So please consider that. I think that's probably enough for now with the announcements. Thank you. Our closing hymn today is, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. It's hymn number 1008 in the Teal Hymnal. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2. Let us imagine joining hands with our community members, guests, family, and friends saying these words together. May faith in the spirit of life, hope for the community of earth, and love for the sacred in one another be ours now and in all the days to come. Blessed be.